Hi, and welcome to Someone You Should Meet. Today, we're in the big smoke. Yes, we're in London to speak with a true legend of the fashion industry, Dame Zandra Rhodes. Zandra, how are you? Oh, well, here in sunshine in London and enjoying talking to you. So I'm really in my penthouse above the Fashion and Textile Museum. Oh my gosh, but what a fabulous place to be. I mean, just talk to me about the room you're in right now. Well, it's, um, it's the penthouse on top of the museum that I built and it's surrounded by artworks and I've been doing filming of different things that we've been doing because I've been talking to both um, LA because of their Brit Week and everything like that. And I would have normally been traveling between the two, but then being that I'm slightly older, we're in a, like a 10 week lockdown because of coronavirus. Yeah, I mean, just kind of how is that impacting you, Zandra? It's had a strange effect, actually. It's quite peaceful because it's enabled me to start thinking, my God, all these years I've been zooming backwards and forwards between London and Del Mar, California. And with my partner dying last year, I've really had to think, well, now I've got to, I'm nearly 80, I better consolidate everything so that I make sure that the museum preserves everything and make sure I see that the museums across the world have all got bits of my stuff that they need. Wow, I mean, mean, just talk to me about the building that you're in, because it's your rainbow penthouse, but it didn't always look like that, did it? No, I bought the building in in 1995, and I persuaded the top architect of Mexico, Ricardo Ligaretta, to build a wonderful orange and pink, wondrous building that's now got um, a preservation order on it. So it's really lovely. And that was before they built the shards. So, and then last year in September, I celebrated my 50 years in fashion. And I also did a book launch and I did one down in, um, in La Jolla and I did book launches in LA and New York. So it's been very exciting. So you have, for the last how many years, almost three decades, you've split your time between Del Mar, which is where we are right now, and London. Um, Like, how did you end up in Del Mar? Um, My partner, Salah Hassanin, who I shared a home with on the beach in Del Mar, chose he wanted to retire to live by the sea after he was president of Warner Brothers International. And he also was a workaholic, so he didn't mind that I was always working. So I was allowed, so I could be here for a week and work on my work and then I'd go there for two weeks. So it's been quite a wonderful life. What are the um, kind of benefits, do you think, of this current situation? Because you're very social and you, you normally like to be around people, don't you? Well, the benefit in a weird, the weirdest thing, but of course you can't appreciate it in California is they do a TV series called Marigold Hotel, the real Marigold Hotel. And I'm one of the stars in this program. So of course it's been on while everyone's in lockdown, seeing what my trip was like in India and all the things that we were doing. And that's been on to the, on the TV the last few weeks here. So that's been another very interesting thing. So it's funny because I was speaking to my mum back in Yorkshire the other day and I told her that you and I were going to be chatting today. And, uh, and she said, oh my gosh, she said, I'm watching this great program with Zandra in called The Married The Real Married Gold Hotel. So just tell us a little bit about that. Well, they choose, they choose eight um, famous people. So they had... Um, a guy called Nasty Nick from, I think, I don't think it's Coronation Street, maybe it's one of those. Then they had Henry Blofeld, who talks about cricket. We had Britt Eklund, who's been an old friend for years. Um, And then we've got a a comedian. Uh, there There were a group of us. And so they filmed our adventures in India, going to festivals and 
would we want to retire there? Rather like the original Marigold Hotel film, but this is a, a series that they now do. I'm glad your mother managed to see it. Yeah, she thought it was fascinating. And uh, what's interesting about this for you is that didn't you get a chance to go and see one of your old studios there where some of your embroidery was, was made? Yes, yes, that's so, so it's, it's quite, well, that one hasn't come out yet, but we've had wonderful, I had wonderful adventures visiting my friends there and seeing them. So it was lovely for me. What do you love about India? Because I've never been, but I know it's, you know, very bright. And I just wondered kind of, you know, how India has inspired your work. It's a very magical country where all rules can be broken. They have festivals, they throw colour. It's, it's just totally not the West. And I've just had, and I was very lucky because in 1981, I was chosen to rep, when they did the first festival of India in London, I was taken to India and to look at all their textile crafts. And that led me to be one of the first designers to do my embroidered dresses there. And there's going to be a whole program doing that. So it's going to be very exciting. I think that's next week's. Wow. Okay. So we'll need to, need to keep uh, posted for that one. That sounds great. And how do you manage to reinvent yourself over and over and over? Because, you know, you've been in this industry now over 50 years, haven't you? I know. That's why suddenly being locked up here in my penthouse, it's made me really think that I've got to catalogue everything. And then I've already got the Metropolitan Museum in New York asking for some of my punk things for their next exhibition. So it's quite wonderful that everyone's chasing me and I'm, I'm sitting here in my lovely penthouse looking at the plants and thinking, oh, I've got to get that job done or this job or trying to manage to do Zoom with you, something else as well. <laughs> Well, you're doing a great job of that. I'm just thankful we've been able to connect, Sandra. So, um, but talk to me about your love for museums, because you actually launched your very own museum, which is literally in the building beneath you, um, back in 2003, didn't you? In 2003, um, we managed to get the museum opened. Um, I felt at that particular time in life that a lot of the time people don't remember that sort of so many British designers have done such important work and it and also how important textile design is to work so it was really to show what wonderful things textile designers have and we've also had wonderful exhibitions with by Anna Sui we had we've had Kay Fassett, Bill Gibb you know a lot of designers that haven't been given space world on the worldwide stage and we've been able to be the first to show it so that's been very good just tell me about like why you got into this industry to start with when you were a child what made you want to get into fashion and textiles as a child i didn't imagine it was going to be textiles or fashion it was really that i was always painting and drawing and thought perhaps it would be that i'd be a I might do illustration, you know, all sorts of things like that. And it ended up that I studied textiles at the Royal College of Art, which is the same college that David Hockney went to. And then when I left college, I couldn't sell my work. This is in the, about 63. So I did textiles for two girls, Fole and Tuffin in Carnaby Street, and then went on to do my designs for uh, with a girl called Sylvia Eight, and we had the Fulham Road show, clothes shop. And then finally, um, I did my designs, I set up on my own and brought them to New York. And Deanna Vreeland of American Vogue publicized them on Natalie Wood. And I started send, selling to Henry Bendell and different shops across America. And that's really how I ended up so much in America. Wow. I mean, you mentioned David Hockney just then. I mean, like how, you know, what did you learn from being around those people and in that particular college environment? 
it was a fabulous time to be at the Royal College at that time. It really was. Um, it was when everything was happening. And it was funny because I've just had some Brazilian people say, well, what was it? I mean, the 60s was quite an amazing, amazing time in, first of all, starting with like the Beatles and the whole thing in the UK and the music scene, then rolling and spreading to the rest of the world. So I suppose it's quite an amazing time. That's when I think about it. Yeah, and you know, your mum was a big influence on you as well, wasn't she? Because tell me about her, because she taught fashion, didn't she? She taught um, draping and she'd been, before the war, she trained, um, she worked in Paris at the House of Worth doing draping on a stand and she taught at the college that I went to, although I never imagined that I'd be going into making dresses. That was something, you know what I mean? It just, what happened was I thought I'd do textile design and I thought I'd teach two days a week to make the money to live and then I'd managed to sell my textiles. Well, I hadn't calculated that I was a textile revolutionary and that my designs would be too extreme to sell. So then I had to work out how to sell them. Then I worked out how to make them. And then, well, the rest is history. But you, you know, things didn't start out too great for you. I mean, you opened up your, your shop in, was it Fulham? Where, where was your shop? shop yeah. Yes. Okay. And but then that had to close, didn't it? So what happened then? Well, Sylvia got a job running Wallace shops. And I didn't see her again for some 30 years because we didn't part amicably, but I decided I didn't wish to teach. And I thought I'll just take, I met these two mad Ukrainian models, Oksana and Miroslava, who were photographed, who were in the, um, photographed in English Vogue. And I ended up taking a collection to America and the rest is history. But I then traveled backwards and forwards. I mean, and lots of up and down adventures in the way. I can imagine. Um, who are your favorite people that you dress? Your, your you know, celebrity guests that you've really enjoyed dressing over the years? Because there have been a lot, haven't there? Oh, I, I mean, it's been quite amazing, some of the people. I mean, you always, the people think of me for that outfit that Freddie Mercury, you know, in the, the, the one with the pleating that I did um, and I did the one-sided dress that you see on um, uh, Jackie Kennedy and of course with with the fact that photographs are all over the web now I just managed to see some of the pictures and you think oh my god that one I didn't remember that that one looked so fabulous you know when you see them and of course Princess Diana I mean your work with her really kind of put you on the map didn't it um, what did you think to her she was actually very shy. I mean, I only made about five outfits for her. I wasn't the main person that dressed her, but I remember when it was the grand sale in, in New York, when she put all those dresses up for sale after her divorce, Susie Menkes, the top fashion person in the world, came up to me and she said, you know, Zandra, your dresses are different from everyone else's because she had that, when she announced she was pregnant, she wore that very pretty off-shoulder one, which was all edged with pearls that looked so fabulous. But tell me about um, a time that she visited your shop, because this is quite a funny story. So you didn't know, you weren't expecting her, were you? Didn't she kind of just come unannounced with a friend of hers? Well, she, I wasn't there. She came with Sarah and the, and the plain clothes detectives and looked at clothes and my partner, and Knight was really pleased. And then what used to happen, she'd probably come in, look at the clothes, and then I'd go round to the palace by special appointment and fit her, you know, for that. Wow, what was that like, going to the palace? It, not Buckingham Palace, I, it's the little one that's in High Street, Kensington. And yes. you have a pass and you have to show your passport and everything, and I drive there in my funny old car and um, go and fit her, which was quite fun. 
Oh, and of course, you've been made a dame. So what was that like, being recognised in such a fabulous way for your, your contribution to the fashion and textile world? Well, that's, that's a great honour, and it's quite wonderful. And my sister loved coming to that with me, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, and then what was even funnier was my sister, who looks like a lovely English county lady with her big hat, and everything and the woman I came out and I had this wonderful little blue hat with a rhinestone egg on the top of it and um, the lady next to my sister said would you wear that hat and my sister said it's my sister and she said oh I'm sorry I'm sorry and my sister said don't worry it's always like that oh that's so funny I, yeah, I've seen a photo of that hat I thought it was great um, but you are renowned for your bold, colourful appearance. What does colour mean to your life? I think colour makes you feel very happy. I think that, you know, I did once have the challenge, I think, from the Daily Mail in England to wear, in fact, oh my God, I'm wearing, I'm actually, it's not black, I've got a printed t-shirt, but the print's at the bottom of it. So it looks like I'm just in black, but at least you can see all the colours behind me. So that's I'm, all right. I've got to ask, how are you maintaining your fabulous hair right now? Because, you know, mine's not looking great. My colour's really dull because we can't get to a blooming hairdresser. Like, how is your hair looking so good right now? Believe it or not, my hairdresser's in Del Mar. But I trim my fringe. She's going to have a heart attack when she sees me. I trim my fringe. And because my hair is really, it's gray, but it needs bleaching. What I do is when it gets a bit too pale, I dab on the color. So it would do until I manage to see her next time. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Well, it's looking great. And would you ever like consider having like, um, you know, a more like normal color hair? I mean, what no. does the pink hair like do for your confidence? I think it, I think my confidence would go and I think that I'd feel a bit too boring. It's much easier to keep it pink, you know. So at least they go, oh, she still looks like that, you know. So I suppose that's the best thing. Yeah, I think as a woman particularly, your hair, you know, does play a big part in your confidence and how you feel. And but I've got to admire your makeup as well. You're so brave. Like I'm, I'm not kind of that confident with makeup, but you clearly are. And where did your like love for makeup come from? My mother always dressed it quite exotically, and I just find that's the one. The one rule is, even if I'm shut at home, I get ready in the morning and make my hair, makeup, and jewelry. I put them on, and that's you know what I mean. So I'm at least presentable if I'm on a screen and have to talk to anyone. So that's so funny because um, I used to model before I was a journalist. And I remember I was, I think, 15 and I joined my first agency in Sheffield uh, in Yorkshire back in the UK. And um, the woman who ran the agency was this really kind of old school um, diva. She was very glamorous. And she said, girls, um, if there is one thing that I want you to remember from this modeling course, it is that you always must at least wear mascara, lipstick and brush your hair because you never know who is going to turn up at the door. I think, I think there's a lot in that, you know what I mean? I think you've got to think of your, your face to the world. And I think that's important. I think at times like this, you mustn't let yourself go to seed. I think you have to you have to at least pull yourself together to some extent. Yeah, I'd agree with that too. Um, but, you know, we touched upon it earlier, but you're a real social person. And, you know, sadly, you know, your partner of over 30 years passed away last year. Um, how are you doing? How is this isolation that we all find ourselves in maybe impacting on your grief? Um... I don't know. I mean, he, he was such a wonderful workaholic. He wouldn't really want me not to be continuing the legacy. And it's, I mean, I haven't been able to pack up my storage unit in Del Mar, but um, 
I've, I've got so much to do here with projects. I mean, I've got this really, really exciting project with IKEA that gets launched worldwide next year. And we're, we're in almost, I'd say, every week we're, we're looking at the different product samples as they come through from elsewhere. Because of Zoom and Skype, we can talk to, I can talk to them in Sweden. We can work out if it's doing exactly what I want so that by the time it comes, we're able to keep working like that, which is really exciting. Wow, yeah, that is fascinating. And, um, you know, obviously you're renowned for your fashion, but I read that your first love is actually textiles. Um, why do you love textiles so much? Because you've got all sorts of wonderful things, cushions, hangings, curtains. I mean, I can turn my hand to all those things that are to do with the home. And I think particularly now that we're in this period of our lives, it's time to realize that we have to turn an awful lot of things into what our home has to offer. Yeah, that's interesting. So maybe kind of going back to, um, you know, what we used to do in the olden days. Uh, how has COVID-19 impacted the fashion industry and impacted like your business? We really don't know the effect of COVID-19 on everything. I mean, I can't, I can't see how half the people can, can yet put out new collections because half the people get their cloth from somewhere like Italy or Europe, you know, for sampling, even if it sometimes then comes from China. I think none of us really know what the impact is going to be at all. Hmm. And obviously you've had to close your museum, haven't you? Um... I mean, how is it kind of affecting your day-to-day -day running of, you know, your studio and, and your museum, et cetera? Um, I don't actually run the museum. That's run independently. I, my own company, um, I have two people, um, most, uh, two thirds of them are on what they call furlough, where they're, they're being paid by the government to be away. And then my key staff took their computers home with them and I talk to them every morning on what they're doing. So we're continuing with wonderful design jobs that we've got in hand and that are all going to be launched later in the year. So it's really exciting. Wow, and what's the demand like? Is there still demand for you know, like your collections right now? We don't really know. I think, I think we're going into new territory. I think all we've got to do is to make sure that we look at this optimistically. Do we rethink how our lives are going to be? It's, it's interesting. I think we're going to find that we're probably going to be much more interested in things that we can do at home with our families as well. Because I think life can't, I don't think it should be totally going back to being the, the same. Yeah, I agree. I mean, what aspects of life would you not want to return back to? I haven't thought about it. All I'm thinking about is trying to get my life in order this side to think about making sure that I've got everything catalogued and I know what's happening and I'm starting to work on the Zander Rhodes Foundation and turning extra parts of over here into a museum and working out my legacy. So I've had that to do in between day-to-day -day jobs. Yeah, you're always crazy busy. Um, talk to me about the beach house in Del Mar and all the years that you spent there. What did you love most about it? Well, it was always very interesting. I mean, it was always interesting, like, what's going to happen this year with the 4th of July? I mean, we had the only double-fronted um, house on the beach, and I designed the, um, together with the top terrazzo artist in Australia, we designed the whole terrace, just the same as he also designed all the floors here at the museum, and one of them's going to be a special Ikea rug. So it's very exciting. 
Wow. Oh, well, tell me about that because wasn't there a, a big El Nino storm back in the 90s that kind of, you know, inspired you to actually um, create that design on your terrace at your beach house? We had a whole El Nino storm and then we had to have the whole of the terrace rebuilt because there were about four houses that hadn't had um, a seawall. So the seawall had to be built and then um, we designed this wonderful terrace and it was wonderful because at that time Bert Baccarat was our next door neighbour and he'd be watching what would happen and then we'd have grand dinners on the terrace. It was lovely. Oh wow, I mean, you know, that's incredible and Del Mar is a very special place and there are a lot of big name famous people living here. Um, talk to me about like how would you, so Saturday today for example, if you were back in Del Mar, like how would you be spending your day today and spending your weekend? I had a studio in Solana Beach so I'd be in there working. At the moment I've also, we're going to do a special um, Sala Hassani Memorial um, Day at the races. So should that be going ahead, that would be wonderful because I've already done the invitations for that. I think that's later in July for the yeah. horse. So we don't know what's going to happen there either. Yeah, of course, because everything is literally on hold right now. Um, I'm not sure about the races. I do know that the San Diego County Fair, which is also held at the race ground, has been cancelled until next year. So fingers crossed that can still happen. Um, Sala was of Egyptian um, origin. How um, much of an influence was that on your work? Funnily enough, it wasn't an influence at all. I mean, he... He didn't ever, he wasn't interested in going back there. He was just the most amazing self-made man who started from nothing when he came over in 1943 to, um, uh, to America and ended up as president of a film company later on. So he was just an amazing man. And I was, we were lucky enough to be together and have a wonderful life there in Del Mar. Wow, it sounds like it really was, um, a, you know, true romance. It's a you know fantastic long-spanning relationship that you two had. And um, how was it like flitting between the two lives? Because um, you know you're always on a plane. Um, I read that you spent maybe like three weeks here and a week back in the UK. Like how how was that on on your life and on your health and on your relationship too? Well, it just happened that it was that way. <laughs> I know, isn't that amazing when I look back? I mean, and now who knows whether the planes are even going to be flying. I mean, this is all something that's now going to be the dim and distant past. And I'm more interested in preserving his name, both for how he also, for what he did for children and what he believed in, and also the fact that he believed so much in my work, which was wonderful. Oh, it sounds like he was a really supportive partner. He was, um, he was, very much so. Yeah, um, how did you find kind of like fitting into American life? No, I'm sure that Sandra Rhodes doesn't try to fit in anywhere. But, you know, it's, it, you know, we, we are, I'm in the same position as you were. I'm from England, you know, I now live here. And there are differences. I mean, you know, did you find, or what did you find kind of especially difficult to um, kind of get used to? Funnily enough, coming to somewhere wonderful like really La Jolla and Del Mar, I mean, there were so many wonderful customers, you know, that, um, that, that and wonderful friends that I had there, you know, that were my customers and that I did clothes for. And then I did an exhibition down at the wonderful Timkin Museum. I mean, that museum complex is really quite fabulous do you know what I mean that all of the museums have you been all around there so which ones are these where are they oh if you go to where they um oh gosh shows you how long I've been I've been away now since January is that frightening oh my god um you know the whole museum complex I'm trying at, to at Balboa Park Balboa Park yes There's nothing like Balboa Park 
you've got the Timken Museum, you've got the Prada, you've got, I did an exhibition, I'm trying to think which one, it's closed at the moment. No, but I did a whole exhibition, they've got folk art there. So I did an exhibition there. And also, if it hadn't have been for being in Del Mar and, and San Diego, I'd have never done opera. I mean, I was asked to do um, opera with, um, by Ian Campbell. And so I did, the first of all, the Magic Flute. Then I did the Pearl Fishers. And after that, I did Aida for Houston. So those are all things I'd have never done if I hadn't been there. What was it like working in opera and costume designing in that environment? Opera's a wonderful, larger than life thing, you know, and I could use my textiles and it, it was really quite fabulous to work on. And another experience that I'd have never had if I hadn't been in, in California. Wow, yes, uh, certainly opportunities kind of present themselves, you know, in ways that we never would have imagined. But obviously the theatre and operas in particular are taking a real hit now, aren't they? Because of COVID-19, none of the theatres are opening. Um, what do you think kind of the future will be for performing art? I think the whole world is going to have a serious problem starting up again. I don't really know what's going to happen. I think that we've all got to be probably, I don't want to say less greedy, but I think we've got to all reconsider our lives and try and work out how these things don't disappear, but how we actually keep them going. And I don't know how we're going to keep them going. We don't know the effect that's going to have on people. Are they going, is everything going to spread once we start to mix again? I mean, I don't know what's, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I think the world's going to look very different for sure. It's going to look very different and trying to think of how, how these things are going to coexist. I mean, I, I, I mean, I was due to be flying back to clearing out some of my storage unit and moving some of my works of art back to London and, and working everything else out. And of course, then the whole world shut down. So we don't really know what's going to happen at all. Hmm. I think we just have to keep our fingers crossed that we've all got a job and we can all keep going and, and see what happens in life that's going to change. Yeah, I think, as you said, it's very unknown right now. We just need to kind of cross our fingers and, uh, and hope for the best. Um, talk to me about your books. You mentioned them very early on in the interview, um, but how, aren't you writing a children's book as well to do with um, flower fairies of Tory Pines, I believe? Oh, I love Tory Pines. And I was brought up, being English, I was brought up with flower fairies. And I've, I've been working on an idea of doing flower fairies in, in Torrey Pines, like um, the magical Indian paintbrush fairy and the splendid mariposa lily fairy. So I, I intend, I still, my sister was talking to me about it the other day. So I'd still like to do that and not let it slip by. Yeah, you absolutely should. I know my daughters would absolutely love to read a, a book by you, uh, especially if it involves fairies. And but for our, maybe our English viewers that are, are watching this, um, what is so special about Tory Pines? Tory Pines is magical wilderness that luckily, um, I think it would have been, it would have been the original Scripps family from... Chicago who used to come for the duck hunting and donated the land and it's a wonderful series of fantastic cliffs with wild flowers wild Californian flowers magically there that and to go for a walk there every weekend was one of the joys of being in Del Mar and you drive down to Del Mar to the beach 
and then you walk up the cliffs. It's just gorgeous. And then you see the different birds that are still there. Sometimes in the very early morning, you'll see the owls. They've got road runners. I mean, it's quite amazing. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's absolutely stunning. And then obviously it's very dramatic because you've got the cliffs and then the ocean down below. It is beautiful. Um, how has San Diego inspired your work? Because as you said, it's very dramatic. It's very beautiful. Um, what you know, parts of, of San Diego have kind of manifested themselves into your work? I suppose really talking about Torrey Pines and the wildflowers in that I think that there's room to do a book like that. Um, I, do, I did appearances both in up in Neiman Marcus and up in, um, what, what's that very chic area that's just up the road as well? Um, oh, I don't know, is it on the coast or is it not inland? Oh, have you not been up to the lovely shopping area that they have up in um, halfway, South Coast Plaza? which is one of the biggest shopping plazas in America and one of the chicest. Oh, right. No, I haven't. I don't think I've done that one. I've done um, Fashion Valley here, which is a pretty nice one, but I don't know. I don't know that one. Oh, well, you need to go halfway up to LA for that one, you know, and then of course I might even, if I'm lucky, be involved in the Ikea there because of doing Ikea, you know, work there. That's amazing. You know, like I said earlier on in the interview, you just keep reinventing yourself. And what's it like to be involved with like a company like IKEA and having, having your textile and fashion ideas um, kind of like actually put into furniture that the whole world can enjoy at a pretty well, reasonable price usually as well. so exciting is that it's going to be worldwide. You know what I mean? It might crop up either in India, in China, in, in Los Angeles, well, there's, there's an Ikea down in Fashion Valley. Do you see what I mean? So who knows? It's the most wonderful project for that reason. It really is. Um, how have you made your fashion um, accessible over the years? Because you, you are known or renowned for your very kind of bold uh, designs and colours. But how have you kind of brought that to people that maybe A, don't have the budget or B, kind of want something just like a little bit more subtle, I suppose. Well, I've done, over the years, I've done various projects, like I do things with um, uh, Vogue patterns. So you can go to some of the shops and get patterns of, in, you know, in somewhere like Yardage Town, you'll probably be able to find patterns of mine that they could use for things. Okay, and um, what's your favorite material to work with? I've always loved silk chiffon, so that's always lovely because it sort of flows and it's quite fabulous to use. And of course, behind me, I've got one of my renowned pleated lame outfits. So, I mean, I really, it really, and, and I, everything, nearly everything I do is probably printed downstairs in my print studio. So there's all sorts of things to do. Yeah, that's a fabulous outfit right behind you. I'm just looking at, looking now. Uh, what's your, what's been your favorite piece that you've ever created? Mm, I don't think I have one. I think it often depends. You see a picture and you think sometimes when, when they do, you know, things appear now on things like Instagram and I think, oh, I'd forgotten that one. It looks gorgeous, you know. Or, you know, like the one that we recreated for Freddie Mercury with the wings and everything. It was so nice, you know. You mentioned Instagram just then, and it's kind of a reminder of how things have, you know, changed and evolved over the 50 years you've been involved in fashion. But, you know, how has the industry changed, Sandra, from when you started out as a young 20-something year old through to now? One, it's unrecognisable, but two, I think it's going to be even more unrecognised because when this lockdown ends, none of us know what's really going to happen. I think this is an extremely interesting time for that reason. None of us really, really know where we're going to end up. Are we going to be wanting to be 
going out and parading or are we going to look back on ourselves and think how wonderful it is that we're here and take and accept a different kind of life i don't know it's very interesting yeah it sure is and um, talk to me about some of the um the ornaments and some of the soft furnishings in your penthouse that we're talking to you in right now oh my god i've got quilted cushions i've got wonderful artworks by my friends um oh gosh i've got a rail of clothes behind me <laughs> um oh i collect pottery so i collect pottery by artists it's quite an in yes paintings of my friends lots of different things all around yes <laughs> Oh, am I right in saying you've even got a piece of the Berlin Wall in your home oh, somewhere? I collect stones, yes. So I've got pebbles from Del Mar Beach as well, and pebbles from all along Torrey Pines. Different bits of rock, which is interesting. So my daughters collect pebbles from Del Mar Beach and they've started painting them because obviously they're not at school right now. They've been homeschooled um, and uh, they're very arty. And yeah, they've, they've painted some lovely little designs on pebbles from Del Mar Beach. Um, but what do you miss most about being in Del Mar, Sandra? I think I miss my friends most of all. I'm very lucky. I've got lovely friends. So, you know, I've, I've missed... I, I sort of try and get hold of them and speak to them every now and again, you know. So, and the sunsets, you know, I mean the sunsets, looking out at the sun as it just hits the, hits the skyline is something else. We're so lucky with the sunsets here. Um, I mean, what I've noticed is the sun actually sets very quickly, but then if you just hang around for like 10, 15, 20 minutes, it's, it's then that the sky just kind of oh. erupts into color. The sky and the sea, I know, amazing. I mean, a, a friend of mine sent me a, an email to say that they could, because at point, one point you couldn't go on the beach at all, you'd be fined, correct? Yes, so that our beach has only been, just opened back up. That must have been so difficult. Oh, it was because, you know, as someone who's lived in Del Mar for years, Andrea, you know, the beach is kind of our sanctuary and it's the place that you go to kind of get away from all the stresses and strains of real life. So for that to be closed, it was definitely tough. And um, what was your favourite time of year in Del Mar? I don't think I had one because you could always rely on a wonderful sunset. Different times you'd see reflections on the sea. Um, it was always changing. And, and it's amazing when you think that the sea never, you think it would be, it's never the same. The sunset's always different. You know, all sorts of different things happening. You know, don't you feel that this, this situation that we're in is, depressing and as frustrating as it is is really bringing out the best in people as well amazing i think that's the whole thing about everything yes i think it has brought out the best in people and you know that is something that's really interesting as well how important are your friends to you right now particularly because you're you're living on your own oh i think my friends mean everything to me you know like the friend who's bringing me around some dinner you know, different friends. I think it means an awful lot. Oh, and um, talk to me about cooking. What do you like to cook? Well, normally in, in, in times I used to have dinners, dinner parties for about, including in Del Mar, a dinner party for about 10. So I'd cook dinner and I'd then do everything myself, you know, a homemade soup. I'd do the the meal and the dessert. Whereas now it's trying to make sure I don't cook too much and I just cook a little that fits, that's just right for me. Yeah, and um, how did living in Del Mar kind of inspire what you cook in the kitchen? Because there's a real strong Mexican influence here, isn't there? Uh, it would have influenced me in so far that I would do, I do say, 
I could do poached salmon and then I do a Mexican, uh, maybe a mango salsa, which would be a very Mexican influence. But we had a wonderful Mexican lady who you worked for us for a long while who taught me some of the things and I'd still love her to be helping me now. But what are you most looking forward to getting back to once we can actually leave our homes? Seeing all my friends. I think that the most important thing, and I'm trying to make sure that in a time like this, that I'm in touch with my friends. And that's what, it's so lovely that things like Zoom have come, come on, that people can at least know that one exists and everything. Yeah, and now you're a wizard, Zoom, so you can certainly use Zoom to stay in touch with your friends. <laughs> we hope I'm becoming a wizard soon. Let's well, go. listen, Zandra, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. It really has. And um, you must let me know if you need any help uh, from this end, and I'll, uh, by all means, um, you know, help you out. Well, it's, you lovely. Some... it's lovely to catch up with you. I hadn't realised that I was going to be talking to you in Del Mar. And... Isn't it a small world? <laughs> And so, hello world, it's lovely. Well, it's very exciting. So I'm so thrilled to catch up and lovely talking to you. And thank you for asking me. Sandra, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, you'll have to let me know when you're back over here and we'll, we'll meet up for coffee or do something nice. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being so patient to get me onto your programme. Dame Sandra Rhodes, it's been an absolute pleasure. You take care of yourself. Oh, it's just lovely to catch up again with California and wonderful Del Mar. And well, make listen, sure you really enjoy it. Well, next time I'm on the beach, which will be later today, I'll take um, a quick video of, uh, of your home and the beach and I'll send it to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Sandra. All the Thank best. You. Bye.